uh, it's difficult uh, to be punctual at this time uh, in Sydney, but thank you all for coming. I'd like to welcome you uh, all here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter McCluskey. I'm the, the uh, Professor of Ophthalmology at Sydney University. And I'd like to welcome you to our seventh Coles Colloquium. Um, and the Coles Colloquium is to honour the contribution of Ken Coles and his father to Sydney Hospital, to Sydney Eye Hospital, to the Saveside Institute and to the University of Sydney. And uh, I know Frank is going to talk a little bit about some of that, Frank Martin, about some of those contributions, but we're extremely uh, grateful for, for his many years of service to us and to the university. And on a personal note, um, Ken uh, really mentored me and helped me to understand how to be a director uh, of the Saveside Institute and helped us through a difficult period when uh, the, the Institute was transitioning roles within the university. So I thank him for that. Our cold colloquium lecturer this year is, is uh, Professor Frank Martin, who uh, I've known since I was a trainee. <laughs> and uh, Frank was one of the people that helped to train me to be an ophthalmologist. And uh, Frank, I think, is extremely well known to everyone in this room. He's done so many wonderful things for ophthalmology and for the college, for, for eye care around the world and for our community. And I think it's a real pleasure to, to have Frank talk to us tonight. Frank's been a paediatric ophthalmologist for more than 35 years. He's been a fearless advocate for paediatric ophthalmology and paediatric ophthalmology training. He's made enormous contributions as a teacher and a mentor. He's, I think, been on, served on just about every committee in Ransco. He's a past president of our college. He's a past president of the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. He still serves on their board. He's been on the board of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, one of, I think, the only person who's not an American to serve on that board uh, to this time. He's been deeply involved in the Children's Hospital at Westmead. For, for ever since it's been there and the children, Royal Alexandra, before it went there. He's been the chairman of the medical board there. He's been the president of uh, CMRI, the Children's Medical Research Institute, for more than 15 years. And he's currently the chairman of the Westmead uh, Research Hub. He's helped to make sure that in the community that the STEP program works. He was one of the people that helped to advocate to get the government to ban domestic fireworks, uh, which were just a terrible thing for eye injuries when uh, I was a resident. And he's also currently on the board of the Lowy Foundation. It's an absolute pleasure to ask Frank to, uh, to talk to us tonight uh, about partnering the Medical Research uh, Institute with the Teaching Hospital. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you very much, Peter, for the introduction. Uh, about four, four weeks ago, Peter McCluskey and John Grigg asked me, oh, could we meet? Uh, I said, sure. I thought we'd just have a nice chat. And they said, oh, would you, we'd like you to do the uh, Coles Colloquium. Well, I was a bit taken back because I really didn't think uh, that I'd done enough to deserve it. But uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this uh, very, very important lecture. The Coles Colloquium honours uh, Mr. Ken Coles. He's been chairman of the Safe Side Institute for 10 years. He served on the Senate of the University. He's done other things too, chairman of the Lizard Island Reef Research uh, Foundation, a leader in the industry. But from what everyone tells me, he's best known for his modesty and his generosity. This evening I'll be speaking on partnering a medical research institute with a teaching hospital. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the west of Sydney, when I was a student at uh, University of Sydney, everyone believed that Sydney ended at Missenden Road. Well, it does go beyond Missenden Road. And the first time I went to Westmead was actually 1988 when it was announced that the Children's Hospital moving to the west 
Uh, I had no idea where Westmead was. I'd heard of it. So I'd, I remember driving out, having a look where I'm going to end up. So here's Westmead. Oops, this is point here we are. You can see Westmead right out here, 25 oops, kilometres from the centre of Sydney. Uh, it's seven kilometres from the popular Aridalmere, which is where the, the centre of the population of Sydney. 23 uh, k from the airport and uh, 2 k from the vibrant uh, city of Parramatta. And there's room to expand west. And if you look closely, you can't expand east. We're done and east. So, we, so expansion is going to be in the west, southwest, and northwest of Sydney. At Westmead, there's a, a vibrant health precinct. It's got health, two major hospitals, Westmead Hospital and the Children's Hospital. It has research uh, with institutes. It's got the Children's Medical Research Institute, the Westmead Research Institute, the Westmead Hospital uh, Research Institute, and the Kids Research Institute, which is part of the Children's Hospital. And there's education. The University of Sydney have committed to have their second campus at Westmead and have committed $500 million to this project. Now, the history of Westmead, well, it started when, uh, in 1978, when Westmead uh, Hospital opened. And, you know, the government recognised the need for a major hospital in the west of Sydney. Sydney Hospital at the time were a teaching hospital, big hospital. It was a 350-400 bed hospital and, and the government did offer the staff of Sydney Hospital the opportunity of moving west and staffing the new hospital. This was declined. So they recruited new staff and started from scratch and built uh, at the Westmead uh, Hospital. In 1988, the government announced that the Children's Hospital were going to be moving west. And uh, as, so at that time, Children's Hospital were at uh, Camperdown. Children's Medical Research Institute were, were, had a small building on the side. So the decision was made by CMRI board. They would move west. They weren't going to stay in the city. Clay. They would move to the west of Sydney. And uh, they actually opened three years on Hawkesbury Road before the universe, before the Children's Hospital building opened in 1995. The following year, the West, uh, what is now the Westmead Institute for Medical Research opened on the Westmead Hospital site. And then in 2001, when Craig Knowles was Minister for Health, I was summoned to a meeting with him and with uh, Kim Oates, who was then the uh, CEO of the Children's Hospital, and Craig Knoll said, out here at Westmead, there are four institutes, they're not working together, we could, you've got to form a hub, and, 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 he, and what he was following was the, what was what Peter Wills in the Wills report had said, there's got to be collaboration and, and institutes have got to work together, they've got to collaborate outside their own area, uh, within the city, uh, interstate and internationally. So, th so the Westmead Research Hub was formed and in 2014 the University of Sydney joined the hub. Early in the piece the relationship between uh, the research institutes and the university wasn't particularly good. Uh, it would, uh, when the new Vice-Chancellor came in uh, he reneged on a a $30 million uh, promise that had been made by his predecessor and he said, and he told me that he, he didn't feel it was necessary to honour his predecessor's commitment. So relationship between institutes and university wasn't good. However, over a period of uh, 10 years, we built a terrific relationship with the University of Sydney to the extent where they joined the hub in 2014 and subsequent to that committed to spend $500 million at Westmead for the, for the second uh, campus of the of this University of Sydney, the Western campus. Now, what Westmead Research Hub, what, it started with four partners. 
that uh, it was the children's hospital. That they, they have a research unit, the kids' research. That's mostly translational research. Uh, the Children's Medical Research Institute, which is uh, basic research, but moving into translational. Westmead Hospital Research, which is once again uh, translational and clinical. And the, and the Westmead uh, Institute, uh, which is uh, uh, once again a, a bench research plus translational. And so in 2001, it, it, these four came together and, uh, and, and they started talking to each other. So instead of buying four electron microscopes, they, they bought one and agreed to share and to share other things. They share um, staff, they share knowledge, and, uh, and so their savings plus productivity. And one-on-one -on -one makes much more than two. In 2004, a, a memorandum of understanding was signed and uh, and it was also agreed that uh, for CMRI we're going to rebuild as for Westmead that why, why build separately why not build right next to each other co-locate and uh, I'll show you a picture in a minute where how they have co-located there's a strategic framework and uh, and then, as I mentioned, University of Sydney joined, and the more recently, uh, New South Wales Health Pathology, uh, the Institute of Pathology, has also joined the hub. Now, Westmead, if you look at a glance, what's going on out there? Well, to use some statistics, uh, there's been a 46% growth in staff numbers in the last four years. There are 1,300 research staff on the campus. There are 979 uh, current clinical trials. It, it's predicted there will be a 250% uh, increase in uh, growth in the next 10 years. And in shared equipment at the moment is 27 million, is what we shared between the uh, institutes. There's publications uh, and with collaboration, collaboration not just within Westmead, uh, but uh, Outside of Westmead, international collaboration with North America, with New Zealand, with Asia and with Europe. Now the Children's Medical Research Institute is, uh, let me find the building for you. Here we are. Here's the Children's Medical Research Institute. This is located right next to the Children's Hospital and if you go out the, the rear door of the, of the CMRI, you're right into the Kids Research Institute. So the two are very, very close together, the two institutes and the hospital. And, the, and, the, and, uh, and, and it's going to be linked once the uh, development's con completed to Westmead Research Institute. So the research part will be linked and will be linked to the hospital. It's going to be integral to it. CMRI was founded in 1958. It is the first paediatric medical research institute in Australia, uh, in Australia. It's a public company. It's got its own board. The hospital actually spun it off as a separate entity because of the fear of government stepping in and taking uh, uh, money which they had from them. So it's a totally separate entity to the hospital with its own board. And uh, it's got uh, it's very strong community involvement. For, it was, uh, there was an ophthalmologist involved in setting it up. Uh, so Nor the late Sir Norman McAllister Gregg was actually chairman of, uh, of the board of the Children's Hospital and Sir Lorimer Dodds was the professor of paediatrics and it was in a Greg's time that the CMRI was formed. It was Lorimer Dodds' idea, but it was formed to the support of Greg. Uh, and, and Lorimer Dodds had an amazing following and they formed these committees. Most of them were led by uh, parents of children he, he treated initially in Sydney, not only in Sydney, but right through New South Wales and beyond New South Wales. And these have continued to fundraise for CMRI. We've also got the Genes for Genes, uh, which is a brand that's well known. 
and more recently the Great Cycle Challenge, uh, which brings in about two to three million dollars a year in donations to the CMRI. CMRI uh, has uh, over a hundred million dollars invested in endowed funds, all of which goes towards research. None of that goes towards building. Now, it's located, as I mentioned, adjacent to the, to the Children's Hospital. This was the plan right from the start. And to, it's to ensure that the, that the clinicians and the researchers work together, they talk to each other, and, and the co-location has remained the key to the success of the CMRI and of the hospital. Now, the CMRI was set up because children, unfortunately, do get uh, uh, diseases and they get uh, serious diseases. Children die from cancer, they die from genetic disorders. And uh, it, it was important to have a, a, a research organisation that's committed to trying to uh, find uh, cures for children, uh, the cause for, the, for a problem cause the child's illness and then work towards a cure and, use, and working with the hospital. One in 20 children is born either with a genetic disorder or a birth defect. That means in almost every classroom there's one child with a problem. Now CMRI over the years has made quite a few advances. It developed the paediatric heart-lung machine which allowed for open heart surgery to be performed in babies. Microsurgery was pioneered at CMRI. CMRI had a microscope way before Sydney Eye Hospital had a microscope. Uh, rubella, well, Greg, whose name I've mentioned before, he was an ophthalmologist, a superb clinician and observer. And in the 1940s, he, early 40s, he noticed that uh, there were babies being born with dense cataracts, unusual type of cataracts. He kept meticulous records. One day in his waiting room, he overheard two mothers talking to each other that they both had rubella early in pregnancy. So he went to his records and he found 13 of the last 16 children he'd seen with bilateral cataracts, their mother had had rubella. So he made the clinical observation. And then it was uh, subsequently with research, uh, it took a long time to convince the British that he was right. The, the Lancet actually wrote, uh, had an annotation that uh, this colonial really doesn't know what he's talking about. And it was, it was only when the North Americans uh, agreed with Greg and New England Journal of Medicine published a, a lead article on uh, linking rubella in pregnancy to birth defects was it accepted that a virus in pregnancy can cross the placenta and cause a birth defect. Uh, with SCMRI, ALT stands for Alternative Lengthening of Telomeres. Tel uh, telomeres is the end of a, each, uh, each uh, chromosome and as cells divide, chromo uh, the telomeres get shorter and shorter and then eventually disappear. And they found that if you can maintain telomeres, you can control cells, and possibly control cancer, control ageing even. And, uh, and CMRI has led the first gene therapy trial uh, for inherited disease in Australia. Now, CMRI from the start has not tried to do research in everything. It's focused on a certain number of areas. And at present, the four areas are cancer, embryology, developmental biology and birth defects, neurobiology and gene therapy. They are the four that the Institute is focusing on. And it's, uh, it's, it, the research uh, spans goes from the bench to translational research. And there's collaboration, as I mentioned, with Australia and worldwide. Now, so let's, I'll just talk about some of the areas where CMRI does work and how it interfaces with clinical work at the Children's Hospital. In 1996, the Gene Therapy Unit was established 
and this was an appointment, Ian, Fisher Ian Alexander was appointed a joint appointment to the Children's Hospital and to the CMRI. This was the first joint appointment. And, and the aim was to try and develop gene therapy and, and methods that we could, if you could find the problem, you could by changing the gene uh, uh, or uh, or at the site where the gene acts, you could uh, cure the problem. So it was. Uh, so gene therapy was established in 1996 across CMRI and the and the child and the children's uh, hospital. Ian Alexander, Fisher Alexander. Some of you might probably know his son better. Ben Alexander. He was a prop in the, for the Wallabies for many years. Retired recently. But Ian is a giant of a man, not only in stature, but also in intellect. He has the Gene Therapy Research Unit. His, his specialty is uh, liver disease, the met metabolism of the liver. And, uh, and he's conducted molecular studies to develop no novel gene therapies uh, to treat children. And... Uh, but to develop, uh, to do gene therapy, you've got to get the, the therapy somehow to the organ where the problem is. And so, and that's done by a vector. And the CMRI, several years ago, recruited Lisek Lasowski from the Salk Institute to develop this area of vectors so that we can have a safe way to deliver gene therapy. <laughs> this is an or a minor audio visual. It'll come back. It's coming. Okay, I'll, I'll go on. There's a condition called spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, uh, which, which is a condition that affects, it's a genetic disorder affecting babies. Babies uh, with this condition uh, generally die with, within the first two years of life. Gene therapy for the... Sorry. I think we're going to shut down. Gene therapy has been developed for spinal muscular atrophy. And, uh, and, and in New South Wales, there's a screening program now. So these babies can be, det uh, with the, who have the gene, are detected at birth. And gene, and they're now, or two children have been treated already with gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. Oops. Stop moving forward, will you? Use this one. Yeah. Yeah, it, should. Yeah. Ah, it should now. Thank you very much. So this is the so this is a, a new area that CMRI is involved in. It's uh, let's move on. Another, another area that CMRI is involved in is embryology and birth defects. Patrick Tam. Uh, he joined CMRI, came from Hong Kong. He's regarded as probably the number one embryologist in the world. They, you know, he's had offers to, to leave CMRI, but he likes living in a Sydney and he's committed to CMRI. And he and his team have spent three decades uh, studying the cellular and genetic basis of embryonic defects. Uh, it continues to amaze me how scientists who work in laboratories can spend 10 years, 15 years on a project and at the end of 15 years find that their hypothesis has failed and start again. And, and absolutely don't lose enthusiasm. As a clinician, we like to see results occurring immediately, which we do see. But so it's a different individual who's a scientist to who is a clinician. And there are some who are clinician scientists. They are the ones who are the real leaders. And uh, it's, it's, it's Patrick has uh, collaborated with Children's Hospital in other areas. There's a rare genetic disorder, Rett's disease, which affects females, leads to development delay. He, 
He's the one who found the cause of this and the problem is still now cure. And then moving towards eyes, ophthalmologists, because we are in an ophthalmological setting, there's that we've got a genetic eye unit, CMRI, which is shared with the Children's uh, Hospital and with Westmead Hospital. This is head, headed by Professor Robin Jamison. And Robin's uh, ability is to find a gene that causes a problem, then she'll develop a model, uh, animal model, and then find a way to, tr to treat it. And to find a gene is like looking for a needle in a haystack. And I've seen, and I'll tell you about a, a, a show, a show an example of how Robin has succeeded with this. At the, at the moment, the eye genetic unit is working on a condition called Labor's amaurosis. This is a rare condition that occurs in babies which uh, leads to blindness. Uh, it's uh, akin to, it's, it's a congenital form of uh, retinitis pigmentosa or night blindness. Gene therapy has been developed for a particular form of Labor's due to the RP65 gene. And uh, we have a family in Sydney who have this gene and, uh, and, and Robin Jamison is working with the Safe Sight Institute, with the Children's Hospital, uh, Westmead, with retinal surgeons from Sydney Eye Hospital and to, to get the team together so that we're in a position to treat these two children from this family with gene therapy. It's not going to restore their sight but it will give them mobility vision, which means they'll be able to continue to, to get around and be independent. Uh, so this is the, going to be the first gene th eye gene therapy that's going to hopefully occur in Australia, hopefully it'll occur at Westmead in involving this side and the Westmead side together. There's a, there's a condition, a new syndrome that was uh, described for the Rosa syndrome. Uh, it, this, was, this paper on it was published earlier this year. It's a, it's a blinding condition affecting, it starts in, in children. And uh, there's a few of us in this room who know the family well, who, uh, it's, who, who have this gene. It started with, uh, a, I saw, I saw to see a little child, mother came in totally blind. She, she came with her uh, uh, daughter, her, this, the child I was seeing and a younger son. She told me that the family had retinitis pigmentosa, her brother's blind, her mother's blind, and she's worried about her son. Well, he didn't quite fit the picture of retinitis pigmentosa, he had, a, he had swelling of the optic nerve and uh, decreased vision. And it was a puzzle what was going on. <clears throat> then we involved uh, then the, the, our genetic unit at the Children's Hospital, uh, Professor Jamison. And, uh, and, that, and the, the, two other, the two siblings at their initial examination were normal. But five, six years later, their vision was dropping. And... Uh, so we have now three, three children all heading towards blindness and we didn't know what was causing it. It, it was looking at Robin Jamison and Marie Flaherty who work in the unit. They looked at the, at the mother, the uncle, the grandmother and it, the picture looked like a burnt out retinitis pigmentosa. But the children's picture didn't fit. Uh, John Grigg and, and uh, Mark... Gillies, they put their heads together and we all decided there's got to be more to it. It's possibly something systemic. So we involved nef uh, nephrologists, metabolic disease people, neurologists, and then a, a paper was published from Utah with the same phenotype, with swollen optic nerve, uh, 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 retinal uh, sw swelling of the retina on OCT, big spleen, uh, uh, they don't sweat, anhydrosis and headaches, exactly the same phenotype. And, and Robin then went after it and she found the gene 
plucked it out of the haystack, the gene that's causing this. And now there are five families worldwide with this condition and they've, this has been published uh, and, it's, uh, and now uh, uh, the next stage is to try and find, now we've got the gene, we know the condition, to try and find a way to, uh, to cure this condition so these three children won't lose their sight like their mother, uncle and grandmother. Now cancer is, is probably the thing uh, that uh, people fear most. Uh, probably the second thing is loss of sight. And Schultz Medical Research has been very involved in cancer research. It's been headed by Professor Roger Riddell, the Cancer Research Unit. The ProCan is, uh, is proteinomics and uh, cancer. And this was Roger Riddell's idea. What ProCan is, it's, it's, set, it's, it's had uh, funding, 45 million grant funding to set it up. And, and what it, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, uh, it's a world first. And what it does is that if someone is diagnosed with cancer, a biopsy is taken, the, a small part of it is sent to the CMRI. And, with, and looking at the proteins making up the cancer, within 36 hours, uh, the CMRI can say that for this cancer, this is going to be the best treatment rather than a hit and miss treatment for cancer. So it's going to revolutionise the way that cancer is managed. And uh, CMRI works with the uh, clinicians at uh, Children's Hospital. Professor Luce de la Posa is a clinician scientist. He spends time at CMRI and there's collaboration there between hospital and research institute. So I think I've shown you some of the advantages of co-locating a research institute with a, uh, with, a, with major hospital and having other facilities available, uh, other research institutes, a university campus. Here we've, we've got the University of Sydney campus. And uh, it just means that there's better communication and that's leading to better collaboration. And so we can go from bench to bedside or bedside back to the bench. Now at Westmead, there's uh, $3.4 billion have been committed to that Westmead uh, health uh, precinct. Yeah, the Westmead hospital is being rebuilt. The children's hospital is going to be rebuilt. The kids research institute has already been rebuilt. Children's medical research stage one is completed and stage two is in the planning stage. Uh, and the University of Sydney are committed to spending their $500 million. Infrastructure. Well, Parramatta and Westmead are not that far now. The light rail, if you, if that, if you go out to Westmead and go to Hawkesbury Road, which fronts the hospital, that's dug up. The light rail is going in there. It's a bit like what George Street looked like. And, uh, and there'll be a rail link from uh, Westmead through to Carlingford. But even more important, the city, the Premier recently announced the Sydney Metro. And the Sydney Metro is going to link the city to the west. It, there's going to be a station at Westmead at the hospital. And it's going to take 20 minutes from here out to Westmead. So it's going to be east meets west. Here we've got a campus where we've got uh, SafeSide Institute, We've got the Eye Hospital, and, and we're part of the University of Sydney. And if, you, and if you look carefully, you can even see a little bit of commercialisation where they sell drinks. But there's a lot more that can be achieved. And I, I, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., in his march on the 28th of August 1963 uh, uh, to Washington, uh, the, civil, uh, the civil rights march, you know, and he said, I have a dream. I too have a dream. And my dream is that this campus remains vibrant with uh, a hospital providing services, an institute, but also moving west and having 
Safe Sight West and Sydney Eye Hospital West to look after the west of Sydney where the people live. Thank you. Frank, that's been fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, really, uh, lots of, for all of us to think about. Thank you so much for a really thank you. inspiring, uh, inspiring thank you. talk. Thank, thank you. Thank again. you very much. There are two other things that we uh, that we do at the Coles Colloquium. We, we've got a couple of cases uh, to present for two of us. Our uh, trainees are going to present, and uh, we'll then get the appropriate consultants to uh, to comment on them. And then the, the chairman of our alumni association, Dr. Ross Ferrier, just has a very short announcement to make at the end uh, at the end of that. So I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Lana Walsh to uh, to come and uh, present her case, uh, and uh, we'll then see comments from the floor. Thank you. wrong end. Um, okay, thanks on it. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name's Alana. Um, my presentation tonight is called I Can't Believe That's Not Periorbital Cellulitis. It's a case from Liverpool Hospital. Uh, I just want to thank Tuan Tran for his involvement in collating the many images that you'll see in this presentation. Uh, as well as Krishna Tumaluri and Claire Fraser for being involved in the management of this patient. Sorry. Uh, so our patient was a 29-year-old man. He was assaulted in March this year uh, and initially managed at RPA Hospital. He had bilateral extradural hematomas which required urgent craniotomy and evacuation. Postoperatively, he woke up in ICU and was noted to have a large angle esotropia and was diagnosed with the cranial nerve 6 palsy, which was initially thought secondary to raising intracranial pressure from his um, extradural hematomas, and it was presumed that he would undergo spontaneous recovery. Uh, his past circular history was significant for myopia, past medical history, nil and no known allergies. So he was referred to us from the traumatic brain injury unit at Liverpool Hospital. Um, with a presumed diagnosis of recurrent periorbital cellulitis. He had been managed by the uh, rehab team with uh, topical as well as, well as multiple courses of oral antibiotics with no improvement. So since the injury, he said that his symptoms included diplopia, periorbital swelling and fullness, as well as this conjunctival redness. And more recently, he'd noticed that his vision had become blurred in the affected eye and he had some colour desaturation. So on examination, his visual acuity in the right eye was 636, pinholing to 624. His left eye was 618, but improved to 69 with pinhole. Um, this was unaided. His intraocular pressure was elevated in the right eye to 30. Uh, he had an RAPD, as well as red and brightness desaturation in the right eye. He had nine millimetres of proptosis and significantly uh, reduced extraocular motility. So he had a complete six. He was unable to abduct his right eye. 
had severely limited elevation as well as some limitation in depression. The left eye had limbal movement. Uh, the conjunctiva demonstrated corkscrew vessels temporally in the right eye. Cornea was clear, AC was deep and quiet. Uh, there was no evidence of any heme in Schlem's canal on gronioscopy. And the fundus did demonstrate some tortuosity of the venous system uh, with a cup to this ratio of 0.5 compared to 0.4 in the other <coughs> eye. So this is our patient. Um, you can see here that uh, he's got significant periorbital fullness and proptosis in the bird's eye view. And then the inset demonstrates or just highlights the corkscrew vessels more clearly. So, and sorry, this is his fundus image. So you can see the venous tortuosity on the right side. Uh, thankfully, there was no CRVO. We actually were able to see his imaging from March when he initially presented to RPA. Um, this is when he had the extradural hematomas and had the craniotomy. Uh, so in the coronal images, you can see in the right orbit that there is a significantly enlarged superior ophthalmic vein. So this extends posteriorly. And on the axials, you can also see this enlarged superior ophthalmic vein, as well as um, in this image, bowing of the cavernous sinus on the right side. So when we saw him, we repeated the imaging. And at this point, you can see that the superior ophthalmic vein has enlarged even more dramatically. Um, so going back into the posterior orbit, there's evidence of optic nerve compression clinically as well as radiologically. And on the axial, you can see the very dilated venous system and, sorry, um, you can also see in, um, more enhanced bowing of the cavernous sinus on the right side. So this patient was diagnosed with a delayed diagnosis of a traumatic uh, carotid cavernous fistula with compressive optic neuropathy. So he had a multidisciplinary team approach to his management. So we suggested IOP lowering with regular Dimox, iodine, and Timolol. Interventional radiology saw the patient as well as neurosurgery and a DSA was arranged for the following day. So this is a selective right internal carotid arteriogram, which um, as you go through the images demonstrates uh, significantly abnormal filling between the right ICA, sorry, I'm going wrong way, um, the right ICA and the superior ophthalmic vein in the right orbit, which is significantly enlarged. So this confirmed the diagnosis and the interventional radiology team decided to uh, repair him with a flow diverting stent and a liquid embolic agent. So this was the um, stenting of the right ICA. They deploy a flow diverting stent and a liquid embolic agent which redirects the flow. Um, and you can see here in these images as we go along that the flow to the superior ophthalmic vein has essentially ceased. So we saw him day one postoperatively and Remarkably, he had improved dramatically. So his vision had come back to baseline, so or equivalent to the left eye, so 618, pinholing to 69. His intraocular pressure had normalized. He didn't have any RAPD at this point, and his red and brightness saturations had returned to normal. He still had uh, some mild proptosis, but it was three millimeters as opposed to nine millimeters when he presented. Uh, his Elevation and depression had improved, however, it was still unable to abduct the right eye. And this is just some progress images uh, which demonstrate the dramatic improvement in apoptosis as well as resolution of the corkscrew vessels in the right eye. Unfortunately, he still has a complete right cranial nerve 6 palsy, so he will most likely require some transposition surgery in the future.
my only real comment as a is to look at the scans yourselves. We probably would have picked up that dilated tibial ganglia in the first picture. But that's what I always say to the patients if it's not that I'm disputing the radiologist, I'm just looking at the eyes because everyone else is probably so worried about the brain. I just need to make sure that there's nothing else going on. I think the sixth difficulty could have been from the raised pressure, but it's not going to happen to the brain. You have to start with that high regard and that uh, six nerves that runs through the cavern signs to be damaged at that point from that high flow. And given that it had high flow for several months, it's probably unlikely to recover now. But it's just a beautiful case of the corkscrew vessels and the swelling and the yeah, the current peris or is it periorbital? <laughs> it's just from the recap thing. So check the films yourself. That's really is these sorts of high flow medications required to tighten up and speed up the neurological? I've never seen a high flow one flow spontaneously. I would be highly concerned if it did resolve because that would make me worry that there was thrombosis beginning in the cavern sinus, which then pushes the high flow backwards and then they get a big stroke. So it's actually usually a very worrying sign if one of these does start to resolve on its own. No, he was an editor. Okay, well, thank you so much, Good evening, everyone. My name's Will Yates. I'm one of the uh, ophthalmology registrars. This is a, a nice case that demonstrates the collaboration between the Children's Hospital and the Sydney Eye Hospital. And this was managed by Dr. Zagora, Prof McCluskey, as well as uh, Dr. Downey. So this is a 14-year-old. Just let me wait, I'm moving. Is there, Morgan, do you know if there's any way of moving that? Okay. Uh, there's a 14 year old female who presented to uh, the Children's Hospital on referral of the optometrist with uh, a right eye retinal detachment and blurred vision which had been going on for about three weeks. She also noted a right eye superior scotoma and that, was, that had only present, presented in the last four days uh, prompting her to see the optometrist. In terms of her ocular history, she was a low myope but had no change in her, her refraction. Her medical history was unremarkable. She was born at term and with normal uh, immunizations up to date. No systemic steroids, however, was on topical clindamycin for her skin. She was in year nine of school. On systems review, she was Vietnamese ethnicity, but had never left uh, Sydney. No overseas travel and had a headache just once a week prior to presentation, but resolved with very simple analgesia. She had no tinnitus, uh, mouth ulcers, fevers, weight loss or rashes. On presentation, her vision in the right eye was 619 and 612. Her intraocular pressures were unremarkable, but she had, and her AC was quiet with no cells. In her vitreous, however, she did have trace cells and the discs appeared hyperemic. And the macula had a granular irregularity and both the inferior uh, retina had inferior bullous detachments, which don't project particularly well on the wide field uh, uh, fundus photography. But with the eye of faith, you can see inferiorly in the right the start of these early um, exit of detachments. And again, they're more peripheral in the, in the uh, uh, left eye with the disc hyperemia. The fundus autofluorescence demonstrates hyper autofluorescence uh, spotted around the, the macula, uh, all the way out to the periphery. And again, areas of patchy hypo, uh, hyper autofluorescence. Her OCT macula demonstrated significant subretinal fluid uh, and disruption of the ellipsoid zones in both the right and the left eye at presentation. Uh, wide field fundus angiograms are conducted and this is the right and weight and you can demonstrate that there's these pinpoint hyperfluorescent uh, dots throughout the peripheries with significant disc uh, leakage in the right eye and the late face and again in the left eye you can see these pinpoint uh, hyperfluorescent dots uh, suggested as a starry night pattern. 
So investigations are conducted. And she, her full blood count EECs were unremarkable. An MRI brain in orbits was conducted, which reviewed no, uh, revealed no evidence of any demyelination. And lumbar puncture revealed raised protein, but no growth on, on culture. Her syphilis and quantiferon gold, as with any uh, inflammatory case, was negative. Um, and the diagnosis was made of, of Voight-Kuyanagi Harada. So she was admitted under rheumatology and ophthalmology and pulsed with IV methylpred and started on a corticosteroid sparing agent as the thiopin. However, two weeks post-presentation, despite the IV methylprednisone, her exit of retinal detachment had become significantly worse, uh, almost touching uh, in the right eye. So the decision was made to transition her over to cyclosporin, a relatively high dose uh, for three weeks. However, despite this, uh, the exit of detachments continued to worsen. Uh, and so the decision was to made, uh, was made and, and that the right eye was, dra was drained, the choroidal effusion was drained with the vitrectomy and now she has silicon oil in that right eye. The visual acuity is now hair movements in the right eye. The left eye is 612 with an inferior detachment and she's just started a Lulamab or Humira. So I guess this case demonstrates a few, a few important topics. I guess the consideration of Voight Koyanagi Harada in children, which is extremely rare. I think there's only two case series of about 20, 25 patients in each. There's a few case reports. Uh, I guess children don't present early. And I guess in Voight Koyanagi Harada, the presentation early is early uh, aggressive immunosuppression is very important. And again, there is very limit, limited evidence in posterior non-infectious uveitis in the paediatric population. And from the case reports, there is a variation in severity. I mean, this, this young girl is at the severe end. And I guess the other management discussion point is the timing of surgical intervention for the serious detachments. And uh, my understanding is she was seen today. Thank you. She's obviously at the very severe end and she's continuing to actually get worse now with her other two eyes, unfortunately, despite the high dose of immunosuppression. I think just a little allude to um, we've worked through the previous book with our pediatric rheumatologist who's helped us with the immunosuppression. Cyclosporin is very toxic and can be used um, for very acute cases. We use it very rarely now, especially with uh, the year. Um, but we still have a better understanding. Also, to highlight the images, the images now that we have the imaging have really changed our management. So, you can see the beautiful picture here. So, she's 14, but we're getting the images down in guns three or four. And the beautiful oral can we see as well. And the optics five four that's now available for kids for the children who have silicon and oil. So, that's also helped us in our treatment in ways in our younger children. Um, but unfortunately, we've actually seen quite a few cases of EKH in the young. Um, Matt, would you like to comment on, on sort of uh, trying to improve these sorts of attachments with the surgery? Yeah, so, so the, you know, John's down here, he went in and did the trick to use the right eye, and I understand that this is the way that your left eye is does the work that it was in the So there's an option potentially um, to go in only in the new retrigger and then to do the genetic inference to only use that for the FI and not even the right to the right hand of the brain because that would be sort of dangerous to the eyes and the right hand of the brain. So that would be the best option to do that. And would that be because one of the challenges we have with these cases is sort of bridging, you know, the treatment until there's is there any other you know, discussion anyone else have any comments? Okay, good. Um, then Perry is going to wait until our last round of the year to make that decision.
there's only one more thing you need to do to do this. Thank you. 